Welcome back to the murky world of lore. The Time Lord repository. Hey guys, did you know that the Doctor travelled with a Cyberman companion? Yeah, yeah, handles. But then there was also an actual good Cyberman. His name was Croton. Um, he came from the comics, and the Eighth Doctor travelled with so many weird and wacky companions. Croton was a martial art fighting Cyberman who retained his human emotions. Um, so a bad Cyberman who turned against his own species and went off on his own adventures before buckling up with Yave Doctor and Izzy Sinclair, who is not a Cyberman... yet. He has been shown battling against pirates, Suntarans, and his own ego, with him claiming he can still do all the important things, carrying a tune, playing a round of golf, and even telling the odd off-colour joke or two. Oh shit, Groats on the Cyberman is cancelled. Eventually, this staff-twirling Cyberman left the TARDIS to go become a god. Comics are weird. Then there was Destry, a cowgirl martial artist from the planet Oblivion. This fish girl, I think, is one of the first companions to ever kiss the Doctor. I grew up with her, one of my favourites. Heather McCrimmon, another comic-only companion, a descendant of Jamie. Cool, ten out here bonking his relatives as well. There was Frobisher, a shape-shifting whiffadil, I'm sure you all know. There were many great things about Frobisher. He had a similar outlook on life to the Doctor. He could pilot the TARDIS. It says here in his wiki, Frobisher did not believe in heaven. <laughs> and this image, which is very, very good. The two parted ways, but Frobisher pops up every now and then. Oh, they won't let you forget him. These days, he runs a bar with a humanoid wife. But he's always on call, as both 10 and 12 in two separate stories have called upon his services. Way we're seeing demons run, huh? Couldn't be bothered to show up to that one, huh? There's Magenta Price, but there's nothing really funny to say about Magenta Price. She green! And last of all, jolly old John and Gillian, who were grandchildren to the First Doctor. Reportedly. Supposedly. These two appeared in a lot of TV comics back in the 60s. If we went by a number of appearances, they would be more valid than Susan. But alas, John and Gillian were mere dreams that the Doctor has from time to time. Or sometimes parasites. Or sometimes creations of the land of fiction. In real world explanation, they just didn't want to pay the license fee for Doctor Who companions. So therefore, John and Gillian never appeared on screen and never acquired an explanation. Ah, the 60s. A simpler time. Die, hideous creature, die! No, no. John and Gillian aren't fucking around, Grandfather. Wow, I stuffed rather a lot into there. Matrix, give us our next fact. Oh no, oh no. The highlights of the Fifth Doctor's most recent outing with the Cybermen was the TARDIS team actually having to come to terms with what happened to Adric. The classic run sometimes could be rather sterile, resistant to character development or drama. In the Davison years, there were the fair share of tuts, arguments, and exasperated cores. But very rarely did people actually speak about their true emotions, other than Tegan. Tegan is a good egg. So in conversion, Tegan has to sit the Doctor down and bluntly ask him, Did you even like Adric? Doctor? Yes? Did you like him? Adric? Of course, Adric. Well? Uh, he had an amazing brain. He was enthusiastic, I inquisitive, a a confident... Uh... Didn't think so. Why are you asking me? It sounds really severe, but it's actually the highlight of this story. Trust Big Finish to react to audience sympathies, and explore character nuance where the classic series was less than interested to. Now, of course the Doctor and Adric were close, and this story he says, although he did find him sometimes irritating, he still had unlimited potential. The arguments in Earthshock are closer to a father-son relationship, which makes his reasoning all the more tragic. This is some great after-the-fact character development. And a really good, honest bit of writing. Because, you know, he could be pretty annoying at times. I mean, he could. I don't have to apologise for saying it. He really could. He could. 
But he was just a kid, wasn't he? And who wasn't a bit annoying when they were young? Well... Come off it! You're a pain in the neck now! No wonder I found him annoying sometimes. Who really likes looking in a mirror? I never had a problem with Adric, but the fact that they're actually addressing the fact that all they did was bicker and argue. It's good that someone is doing stuff with their relationship and this troubled dynamic after the fact. Sorry Adric, the doctor's piloting skills may be getting insanely good to rescue people from crafts, and that is skills with a Z. Kill me. But we are never ever coming back to you. And I think that's a shame. As much as I like this story, it does feel like an addition only made because Adric is an unpopular character in the fandom. Imagine, imagine if the Doctor had this chat about any other deceased companion. There's more to say about Adric's death, but I'll save that for another time. And last of all... The Case of the Mona Lisas. The Mona Lisa, for those uninitiated, is the Earth's most famous painting. It's even pretty good! But like any piece of famous culture, from works of fiction to historical people, landmarks, objects, it is a complicated time and space canon nexus. Of course, more than one story has used the Mona Lisa, but okay, let's try and track the Mona Lisa's story. Through the eyes of the Hooniverse, at least, would I look like an eye historian? Started in 1503, as seen in the comic Art Attack, Clara Oswald was supposedly the model for the painting. Because that girl gets everywhere. Later that year, another time traveller gets involved with the painting, as Count Scarlioni commissions six identical copies of the painting. These were part of a really elaborate plan to fund a world-ending, time-changing experiment. The Fourth Doctor and friends foiled his evil plan by defacing the other copies and punching him. Ah, classic -y. A fire seemingly destroyed all of the fakes except one, which was then put into the Louvre. Except we also know that the Leamington Spa Lifeboat Museum has one, from <laughs> the Flash game security bot. The Monk apparently stole a copy during the second Dalek invasion of Earth. And the Doctor has one in the TARDIS as well, as early as the seventh incarnation. But hey, if anyone deserves a copy, it's him. In the Art of Destruction, he carried one up Mount Everest on Camelback to save it from war. Which is kind of the opposite of the message of City of Death, no? Especially as Unit HQ have another 13 copies of the painting in Sydney. Why? I have no clue. But in the future there are Mona Lisas everywhere. Here's Rory using one as a makeshift weapon. The one in the Louvre was lent to the International Gallery in London in 2009. Where she suddenly came to life and escaped the painting. Okay, so let's get this straight. Previous incarnations of the Doctor worshipping a picture of a companion he hasn't met yet. Only for said picture of Clara to become the subject of many a paradox and evil scheme, for then it to go and terrorise the Sarah Jane Adventures gang. <sighs> like I said, Clara gets around, even in places where the showrunners didn't intend. Personally, for my money, I prefer the Monk version. Paint me like one of your French girls. Boom, there's another. Three videos, three days. Take care, wash your hands, and stop coughing on me.